when Sarah called me and said, hey, you know, we want to bring you in uh, so you can talk about some of your own failures, I was like, ooh, you know, <laughs> pit feeling in my stomach, an intimate conversation, you know, to about 10,000 people. Um, I thought, you know, actually I can do this because I founded a startup that was actually about honest talk. And it was actually inspired by the rather abrupt death of my parents. And I actually tried to hack that. I actually wanted to figure out a way to help people solve really hairy personal problems uh, by crowdsourcing um, answers in um, a fact-based but compassionate way. So um, the, the sort of zeitgeist of what Lean Startup is about is um, something I've thought about a lot you know, with my own business. Um, well, then I looked at the program and I saw that the title of the session was Innovation Accounting. Okay, well, I worked in an accounting firm for eight years and if there's one thing I know, the fastest way to end a conversation is to <laughs> use the word accounting. Welcome to my life. Yeah, so those of you walking out right now, you know, come back in. Um, but, you know, then I started to think about it a little bit more and Eric and I talked um, to prep for the session and what I realized was this, you know, this is at core a lean startup revival meeting, right? <laughs> is it not? We've already heard and we're going to be hearing like all day long these amazing stories of people taking flight through application of these principles. Well, to have like a really kick-ass revival meeting, you have to start in the lows, okay? You know, you have to really explore, you know, those really dark moments and um, just swim in them and then kind of convert them. And, and through doing that, we can take flight. So Eric, when we talked, you know, you told me some challenges about innovation accounting. Can you yeah, share that Yeah, sure. I mean, they, the, the list is endless. And I, first of all, I applaud you for being willing to come and speak honestly about, uh, you know, the post-mortem. People, when they do want to do post-mortem, they sometimes skip over the mortem part because it's embarrassing. And so thank you for having a chance to talk about this is this is really important to me. And I mentioned at the top that an innovation accounting doesn't fit on a bumper sticker and nobody wants to talk about accounting. And yet, uh, it's really the foundation of how we hold people accountable in our modern economy. And most modern management methods are based on the traditional general accounting principles that have been used in companies like General Motors for decades now. And we forget that those methods were not just about keeping track of where the money went. They were used to figure out which managers are doing a good job. How do you know a manager is doing a good job? It's because they're ahead of plan. Right? They're beating the forecast. Where did the forecast come from? Oh, that's the job of accounting or corporate audit or the CFO. There's an accounting function that makes those forecasts from what? They make the forecast from the long and stable operating history that the company has. So since what we're doing this year is basically the same as what we did last year, plus or minus current macroeconomic conditions, we can make pretty accurate forecasts. Raise your hand if you're in a startup and you've ever had a forecast come even remotely true. Anybody? I think we got three hands up out of 1,000. So yeah, not, we're not doing too well. Right. I, I didn't even know that that was something that was possible. When I first read about this accounting, general accounting principles, I said, wait a minute. There are places in the world where people make forecasts and then they come true? Oh my god. Like That would be really awesome. So what we need to do as a movement is create a new accounting system that can help us uh, report progress to the people that hold us accountable, investors, CFOs, our spouses in a lot of cases, uh, that are not denominated in vanity metrics and bogus forecasts, but in something more real. And that's actually really hard. I, I found it to be incredibly hard. And uh, you know, before we dig into the elements of innovation accounting and get really specific about mistakes that I made, um, I do want to set some ground rules, which are, I mean, I want to be really clear about this. You know, I went out to, um, first of all, start uh, my business and, and, and create a product and pitched it and got investors to sign on. And I deeply honor the fact that they did that and that they believed in me. And I, I continue to do that to this day. So this is not about blame game. This is at all. And in fact, my role here is to talk about things that I did. I was the founder CEO of this company, things that I would do differently next time. So I just want to be super clear about that because I think that we're all in those sort of positions. And that's one of the things that holds us back from really sharing like the guts of what really happens on the ground. That's okay. Yeah, we, we create the problem. I mean, the investors that we like to make fun of when they're not in the room, and it was great that we did this conference on a Monday because a lot of the VCs are in their partner meetings. <laughs> they, they couldn't be here. I'm really, I'm sorry, because now we can talk honestly about these issues. Uh, <laughs> when they ask us for the vanity metrics and, and get mad at us that we don't produce them, where did they get those vanity metrics from? From the pitch deck. 
Where'd they get the pitch deck? We gave it to them. When we were trying to get the money, we made the most ludicrous, giant, numbered promises we could make in order to get the money, which I understand why we do that. But we create these crazy, inflated hockey stick graphs uh, using numbers that are so large to get people's greed going, but not so large as to make us sound crazy. So you find that sweet spot of what you can promise. And then it's no surprise to me anyway that VCs show up and they say, well, you said on month, the graph is like dots over time. So on month X and year Y, you said you would have this much money in revenue, and you don't, so you're failing. So that's our that's our own fault. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for absolutely. for willing to say that. So, you know, it's not really easy to to sit up. And I'm I'm kind of bummed there's not a box of Kleenex <laughs> next to me because this is not the easiest session of lean therapy um, to have. But um, <laughs> uh, we we want to start with um, the minimum viable product phase, you know, establishing the baseline. So I'll share, do you want to, just quickly, for those yeah, who may not be, minimum viable product, you know, that first prototype, you know, out of the gate, so you can start having something to interact with and setting your baseline for metrics. Well, um, you know, I talked to my husband, you know, put some money down, you know, we, I, I worked with some people to put something out that was, um, you know, kind of ugly, but kind of cool too, and got some good feedback and some stuff was definitely not working. Um, and, it had no metrics like whatsoever on it, <laughs> like like zero. Just just getting it out the door was sort of you know the key metric. Um, started to iterate through some alternative MVPs, if you will. In in parallel, you know, was seeking to raise money as well, and and um, a, a group, well, raised a, a round of convertible debt of people who knew me, kept iterating the product. And, um, you know, this platform was actually serving multiple masters. It was kind of uh, a complex business model, which made it difficult to focus um, our development energies on who we were really trying to please. I'd, I'd say that was, you know, definitely um, created challenge from the outset. But I'd, I'd like to start at a point in time when um, we took a more substantial round of funding and um, I want to share like a really cringeworthy mistake that that I made. Um, I actually want to. I would really like it if you could rate my mistakes in terms of cringe points, like on a scale of one to ten. You know, ten means Eric is crying. <laughs> I want to make him cry. Um, so uh, we got a term sheet. I got a term sheet, and we were you know negotiating. I didn't have alternative term sheets to negotiate with. So it was like, uh, you know, you make a, a decision as a CEO, like I'm either taking this or game over, you know, so I own that decision. And a metric was thrown in there at the last minute that was related to traffic, which was actually not very related to my business. I mean, we were actually, our, our core model was going to be around selling monthly subscriptions. So in essence, cringeworthy mistake, um, I accepted a vanity metric in my term sheet. Eric, could you comment on Ouch. that? <laughs> you know, it's actually, it's actually very common. And again, I, I want to take the VC's perspective because they want something to hold you accountable for. Mm -hmm. And if all they know is traffic and eyeballs and, you know, gross vanity metrics, and that's what they're going to use. It's not the worst term sheet vanity metric. I, I once had a I term sheet. I don't get sheet. a 10. What's that? That? No, because I once had a term sheet that had uh, requirements about how many press releases we would put out <laughs> <laughs> about the funding. <laughs> it was like... So yeah, I've I've uh, I've made even worse mistakes. That's best practice, yeah, actually. Please, please. Yeah, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. So uh, taking this in, you know, now we move away from like baseline product into, you know, let's try to instrument the machine, right? Phase two of innovation accounting, and essentially, I was serving multiple masters. So I, I kind of like to say, in a way, I was kind of managing two companies. And we had a setup where we had monthly board meetings, uh, which is a lot. And I'm you know, kind of busy trying to push the business forward the way that um, we, we believed and the team believed it was supposed to be. And, and by the way, the vanity metric, like, it wasn't that far. It wasn't unrelated. But you know, when you're dealing with such scarce resources, you have to be so uber focused. You know, so I wound up spending like a, a few weeks, you know, working on the, what I thought the business was, and then you know an extra week prepping for um, for for these important you know board meetings, reporting on these other metrics, and then you know racking my brain for how to weave the two together. 
Now, by the way, I have 20 years of experience in innovation. <laughs> I've worked for you know, a startup that IPO'd. Like, I, I'm not a moron, you know? Um, I'm very good strategically and whatnot, but it was like close to impossible. So feel free to comment. Oh, sure, yeah. Well, we, one of the speakers at the Ignite last night likened um, you know, getting stuck on the vanity metrics and trying to stay focused on what we're trying to do, uh, almost like meditation. And I thought that was such a great metaphor because uh, we need so, such absolute focus in a startup. Uh, and yet, most of the time, we're distracted by chasing the latest, greatest thing. And the, the pattern you just described of like, there's a board meeting coming up. And so, I mean, we used to, one of my companies, like the, the started out like the night before the board meeting. We'd be like, uh-oh, board meeting tomorrow. We better run some metrics. So we have something to report in the board. But we've, we've done like four weeks, six weeks of really solid good work. So obviously, the metrics are going to be great. And then we'd like run the report, and the metrics would be bad. And we'd be like, oh my god, uh, come up with some whiz-bang demo for tomorrow to distract the board meeting. Right? <laughs> That's like, so then we eventually had the idea, hey, what if we ran the report like a week ahead of time so that we could do the fire drill a week ahead instead of the night before? And then we started, and we were like, you know, if we're going to run the company these metrics, maybe, uh, maybe we should look at them like while we're running the company. What do, what do you say? I mean, that's, that was the state of the art. It's a, no, nobody ever told us to do that. It was just like show up at the board meeting with your metrics. And eventually, I mean, that's where vanity met concept of vanity metrics came from. Then once we started looking at them like once a week, we thought, well, that's really revolutionary. We started to notice that once a week, our metrics hadn't changed since the previous week, even though we'd done a week's worth of work. And that's like, that's the thing we're trying to distract ourselves from. You know, in meditation, there's like an existential thing we're trying to distract ourselves from. But the existential angst of being an entrepreneur is that most of the time, most of the things we're doing is having no impact on customers whatsoever. And wouldn't you rather not know? And I feel like that's very, a very human desire to just think about something else. But guess what? If that's the reality, then we are so doomed. We may as well you know, do something about it. So Eric, should we pivot or persevere now? <laughs> Phase three? Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Yeah. So pivot or persevere. I mean, if you're tracking your metrics, you know, you make <laughs> that, that tough, draw that tough conclusion, like this ain't working or, 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 or we stick with it. And I just wanted to call out, you know, the challenge of, it, it, that's hard for anyone. You know, when you're going back to the people that you, you know, sold a vision to, to say, we need to change, that's, that's definitely hard. Um, I, I personally am someone who, if the data, you know, says we're doing the wrong thing, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty mercenary about throwing it out the window. But at the end of the day, you know, you have, you're, you're a steward of the capital that came in, and, and you need to socialize that. And th that's pretty hard. And as a, um, a first-time entrepreneur, uh, maintaining that trust and kind of keeping it going, I, I found was pretty tricky, especially when you start moving into like multiple pivot situations. W could you comment on that? Well, don't forget that, that our investors, and again, this is true in an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial setting, our investors have an option other than pivot or persevere, which is to go do something else with their time because they have a portfolio. So it really should be pivot, persevere, or portfolio, uh, which is just focus on one of the other companies that's doing better and so shut you down. Now that, as entrepreneurs, we don't like to think about that, but that's the reality of what happens. And so it's our obligation to, to figure out how do we show progress in meaningful ways even when the vanity metrics aren't awesome. And that's really what we're, that's kind of the name of the game in the uh, Lean Startup techniques that are about uh, evaluating if the things we do make progress. Because during the long flat part of the hockey stick, in the really successful company, something is happening. There's, there's something brewing in microscale that actually has predictive power for the future. But in order to demonstrate that to our board, we have to use math. So I understand why nobody wants to do it. It's math. Math is hard. But guess what? That's just what's required. And if we master those techniques, I've seen it now in companies where we can actually demonstrate that, uh, you know, just like you saw in the Summit Schools examples, that the work that we're doing is actually making a difference long before it shows up in the vanity metrics. So that's awesome. So in conclusion, there's just a point I want to get out to all of you because I, I am sitting here, you know, having not succeeded, I hope to be an entrepreneur again and to continue innovating. And I just want to say, you know, we are so fortunate to do what we do. We are able to, you know, every day go out there and try to create the future. So even though we fail and we fail a lot. This is such honorable work and we should, you know, feel honor in the mistakes that we made and share them with each other and like garner those cringe points. Like it is so cool because if I'm not the one who succeeds, you know, someone's going to be standing on my shoulders and we'll make the success happen. So for the good of the ecosystem and for the good of the world, fail and fail fabulously and share the news.
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.